The living dead are among us. They are one of the greatest threats to humanity. What will you do when the zombies come? No defense was built to last forever. And tonight might be your very last one on Earth. What will be your plan B when they come clawing at your doorstep? I was whisked off to see if I couldn't make a habitable place for four colonists in Rimworld for a hundred days among hordes of the undead. Every day they grow in number until we take the fight to them. Life is existential torture, but at least these walkers give meaning to the survival of every unforgiving minute. What decisions would we make to save ourselves from the ever-growing threat of the undead? I survived in Rimworld for a hundred days of the zombie apocalypse, and here's what happened. We crash-landed from outer space escape pods several days before the arrival of the living dead on the map, a large mountainous region whose west side was rife with minerals. We equipped our weapons, revolvers, bolt-action rifles, in Rimworld what's considered primitive technology. Open areas off to the east and the south, and a small pocket to the north. We would settle on the western side of the map with no zombies to fear. Gathering our senses to the best of our abilities, the answer was inward. Like Michelangelo, we'd carve into the marble of the mountain and level the trees standing in our way. Time was of the essence, and there was no time for vomiting. Our crew got right to work, Hux mining down the wall. D, Orwell, and Bradbury making their way up the rear with essential resources. Time was of the essence, only two days and 21 hours before the zombies arrived. We got to work and constructed a temporary shelter. Our men were hardened, wily devils, but who wants to sleep on the ground in the middle of the forest? And so it was decided that the labor be divided among the four of us. Some men hunting, meeting our short-term needs, while others would carve into the mountain for later security from the zombies. We slept that night in some makeshift beds. The next day, the operations continued deeper into the mountain. While just outside at the cave entrance, we accounted for all of the supplies on our important expedition. By the end of the day, we were set up royally with all the conveniences anyone could ask for. The architecture of my original design was intended for utility, not aesthetics. But as we made our way deeper under the mountain, we began to make for ourselves a life of greater domestic comfort, carving out rooms for storage of our goods, as well as wide hallways up and down which to parade. Yes, it seemed as if everything was just going hunky-dory in the colony. Until the zombies emerged. They came from the map edges, underground and sideways. It wasn't long before all of the local wildlife was maimed or brutally murdered. Whatever wasn't bitten was beaten and killed within a few days. We worked undisturbed in our cave for now. If we could extend the power of our creation out to the cave entrance, we'd be safe. If you're creative with your defenses, you might not ever have to fight your enemy. So we began to outfit the cave with all manner of traps. And as the rains outside washed down on the ghouls, we comfortably rested on the inside of our cave. While these were just only the first sprinklings of the horde to come, we started off good, and that was a good place to be. But the chaos of the outer world was driven inward, and the last of the wildlife came into our cave, seeking refuge and revenge. A mountain lion, a bad omen, and it was the last natural thing we'd see for a while outside of the mouth of our cave entrance. We posted a watch for the next few days, with our long-range bolt-action rifle. With the integrity of the terrain itself, the zombies wouldn't pose much of a threat for a while. We turned our attention to longer-term needs. Food, safety, and sanity. The length of the cave entrance afforded security. If we dug and ventured a little deeper into the mountain itself, we could carve out individual bedrooms and give ourselves some personal space. For the last day of the glory of nature had passed for a long, long time. And now we turn to our own creations, man-made machines and fixtures to keep ourselves secure. The underdark of our own fabricated world, separate from the natural one, and now removed. No one came in, and no one went out. A simple life, but you could say that it led us to become a little stir-crazy. The brightest on our color palette was the blood of our enemies. The resources we had pulled from the earth lay there, scattered in our one storeroom. We depended on a wood fire generator with precious little wood for our power source, for there was nothing else to generate power underground. So commenced a great hibernation. Nothing came in and nothing went out, save the rocks we needed to get out of our underground shelter. But the nights raged on and the ghouls didn't rest, festering, creeping, and clawing their way ever further inward, desiring our flesh. Our number was four, 
and I liken our struggle to that of Atlas. If only Atlas had another pair of arms. Unlike Atlas, we could multitask. Two men defending the cave entrance, two men working and making progress inward. Occasionally, we were afforded an easy break by traders coming inward, and if they made it to the compound, they'd usually dropped all of their goods before they'd arrived at us. The lucky ones died on the spot, and for the unlucky ones, it was only a matter of hours, or days sometimes, before they turned. For the undead, like the wind, were tireless, more a force of nature than anything else. But when traders would leave, we welcomed the opportunity to scavenge what resources we could outside of our cave, for we'd be stuck in here a long, long time to come. And if you've ever been stuck, you know the best way out is to get busy. And so we became self-sufficient there in the base. Biofuel refining, hydroponics, these were just a handful of the technologies we researched. But you know what they say, the fool needs to see the fire underneath him to be motivated to save himself. The resourceful man, keenly aware of the little time he has in the world, gets working right away to unfasten his shackles. And so we busied ourselves underground, every day carving out what little leverage we could to make of that crease in the wall a home, a bastion of defense. Now we had stretched it for every fiber of its potential to sustain our livelihood there, living in a crack in the wall like explorers, finding themselves doomed to a most abominable fate in their mortal coil. The threats of the outer world and the living dead were ceaseless and terrifying. And though a life trapped in rock was certainly not one worth living, at least as it sounded on paper, the alternative was mere moments of inhuman violence. To recount what inhumanities we witnessed just outside the walls of our cave, so much depended upon the most unlikely of resources. Steel for our turrets was as essential as air to breathe. But when you have nothing else, you at least have teamwork. And in the words of Rousseau, the efforts of two hands working in conjunction are greater than two could ever accomplish individually. Loosely speaking. For we had eight. While one set of hands fired a bolt-action rifle between the eyes of encroaching ghouls, another set of hands reloaded. And yet another set of hands was busy reloading the barrel of a turret and another one carving its way deeper into the mountain, seeking more steel and more opportunities. For the resources within the mountain constituted our ticket outward to the freedom which lay without our de facto home. Meanwhile, outside, nature was given back to that primal struggle of constant combat. Fools battled raiders, battled megasloths, battled thrombos. We exempted ourselves from the fight through a layer of turrets. In an odd coincidence, one ghoul conveniently carried with it layers of the stickiest of goo, trailing layers of intractable slime beneath it, for all passers-by to struggle and surrender. The slime was certainly sticky, globulous goop, and it made for another natural layer of defense from all life seeking to take refuge in our cave, which turned out to be a threat perhaps even more serious than the ghouls themselves. The pieces were played, and the first game had ended in a stalemate. We were alive enough to count ourselves better off than those who had ventured outside the cave, but the journey continued. The ghouls were making their way closer to our inner cave in a most unanticipated way, and finding any steel necessitated the strip mining of the deepest caves to discover the innermost riches of that crack in the wall on which we had embarked. It would be quite a while before we once again saw the light of day and took part in the glorious, bountiful riches of mineral deposits and vegetation that were still cropping up and out for grabs in the main world. Being forced to stay in one location while you watch the world around you move on by is psychological torture. Our struggle manifested itself as an introspective geological fight for the elements within the walls of the mountain. The deeper we mined, the longer our hand reached out toward the inhospitable world around us and tamed it into something suitable for habitation. We stared aghast as zombies killed a thrombo. Around this time, we resolved to weather the winter air. Seeing our breath indoors was enough motivation to undertake an expedition back out into the sunlight. We braved the treading of that sticky goo about our cave entrance in search of a few valuable assets laying in the sunlight, unclaimed and up for grabs out there in no man's land. A heavy SMG. A splendid prize. The hunt was on, and we were the masters of the hunt. Now, now we could take the fight to them, but for now, we rested. For it's said that the flame that burns brightest burns out the fastest, and you're better off quitting, or at least scaling back when you're already in the lead. Mother Nature, seeing that our work outside was complete for now, laid a winter blanket over the earth all around us and we tidied our home inside, adding upgrades and scaling up to prepare for the spring thaw when we'd begin to take back the world around us. 
up until now given over to strife and murder. We cleaned the caverns and made them ready for spring. Some good fortune. While we mined, the zombies mining into our base from a most undesirable angle chanced to crack their way into an ancient underground danger and fought the inhabitants within. The miner was killed, buying us the precious time we needed to weather the winter inside of our home. They consumed the flesh of those they felled. Seeing that there was a lull, and that we had one clear shot before the spring thaw began, we acted fast, and set out with one more expedition into the cold air. This time, outfitted with incendiaries to bathe our enemies in fire, and cleanse the winter world of their taint. Our fire turrets were in place, and there was a short window of opportunity before the next horde washed upon the walls of our caverns. There was a clear path through the goop before us, but time was ticking, and it was dangerous. So with a little treading through that sticky goo, we infiltrated the areas they had so overwhelmed and snuck into that ancient underground tomb. With just a few tosses of our Molotov cocktails, their doom was sealed, and we survived the harshest winter we'd ever known. Emerging from that wintry cocoon, outfitted with all the steel and components we'd need to get a foothold in the spring. The world itself was now transformed, a ghost of its former self. Even the quiet of the muffalo had been disturbed by the festival of fire that bathed the world in destructive light while the snowstorms raged over that abysmal apocalyptic world. We had invented, in the interim, entirely new ways to maim and murder during that winter. And perhaps as just desserts, our own primitive turrets were ultimately destroyed by their very own destructive patterns. The ghouls frenzied and raged, engulfed in fire, bathed in flame, giving light to our very own creations. But by the time the rains of spring washed away the snow of the cold, we had consolidated our destructive weapons of war into just a couple of auto cannons to punch out hope from anyone who would dare venture near our home. The plans were all coming together. We exited the winter with the world's strip mined as if the manifestation of some geological catharsis. The sky shed tears, and it ended with a great purification. The earth was wiped clean with a fresh slate, and as cool raindrops fell on the dirt, cleansed of the blood of our enemies, we busied ourselves in the safe range of our auto cannons and repurposed our components that kept us alive in the winter for more productive, constructive uses in the outside world. We emerged to build new footholds in the open, fresh air, living once again in the woods and among the new fauna that had migrated to the region from somewhere safer. Another colonist joined us, and we punched our way back out into the world under the righteous vigilance of the weapons we had diligently constructed and fussed over that winter. Our creations had literally paved for a new way of life, and despite emerging threats from the east and the south, I felt confident. Now the focus of attention lay in paving a new infrastructure to our outposts dotting the map. Sure, the shambling threat would not abate, but our technology could sustain us. And we had done what is essentially the goal of any RimWorld playthrough, not necessarily go to space or leave the Earth, but as my friend Trupin once said, to make a colony into a splendid factory, where each colonist is an expert cog in a machine, a master of his niche. It was crazy and chaotic and beautiful, a triumph of planning there to visualize in all its exciting colors and patterns. There now on the surface of the outer world, we could once again tread, unwavering, dignified by the fruits of our labors granting us safety and security. We entered that fresh new world with help from traders in the mountain that had supported us. For now, we no longer had to sit back helplessly as we watched traders have their eyeballs devoured by festering ghouls, but rather we could defend their eyeballs with righteous true aim. And so we constructed outposts about the map and took back the land as redeemers do. Everyone was safe, and under the opening eyelids of the morn, we shepherded traders seeking refuge in our halls. Now we could reclaim the weary world, clad in tough armor, armed with fierce weapons, and poised to beat back the clawing threat. We constructed a wall on the north, clearly marking the bounds from where we had come. From then on, our distance from the threat would grow until it faded from view on the horizon. So, 100 days gone by, but what lay ahead? As always, I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. A major thanks, as always, to my patrons, for they are the autocannons that defend me from the ghouls clawing at my doorstep. Until we meet again next time, take care.